Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. <clears throat> morning, Bob. Good to be back after a break for a week. <clears throat> Okay, so what's been up while I was gone? Looks like we, we made 360 degrees in the market. <laughs> market is not up. That is true. Uh, it, it shows, you know, how much difference just a week or two can make uh, in the short term. For sure. Yeah, but uh, I guess that's life. That's that's a that's a market. That's the price of uh, what do you call price of admission to be in the market is uh, we have to go through these days. Well, that's okay. <clears throat> Nvidia is blasted by Kramer. Uh, I mean, Kramer is is entertainer. At least that's what I consider entertainer because I think he just follows the market. Um, I started watching him or listening to him three years ago, four years ago, but last one year I just um, gave up on him. I mean, he was so, depending on how the markets change, he was bullish on Ethereum. Now whole crypto market is down. His thesis is also changed. Uh, Ethereum GPUs, uh, Ethereum does not needing GPUs. Uh, so if you recall, Nvidia had uh, anyway made a changes in their GPUs to have a very specific around Ethereum. But this is not a new news. This has been in works for, for months. So I wouldn't consider that as, uh, the biggest threat to NVIDIA, but uh, even AMD, yeah, even AMD is down. So I don't know, Ethereum just moving to proof of stake is the biggest impact. The most of the, the biggest revenue driver for NVIDIA, of course, was, was gaming. And now the future focus is data cent I mean, data center and the automotive. So I won't worry much around the Ethereum miners dumping the GPUs in the market, they probably will move over to other um, proof of work protocols. Uh, see a new definition of LD is life term. So I think it, in my opinion, that's what it should be anyway. Uh, more and more I you know stay in, in market uh, that wasn't my case when I started but more I think I think that's what it should be start uh, investing with that philosophy that I'm gonna stick to it until something changes in the company right uh, market crashes anyway so let's uh yeah at least to the <laughs> day you retire I think retirement planning is completely separate. Uh, yeah, uh, depending on uh, where are where your assets are, uh, some people might continue to still stay in the market during retirement if the nest egg is really big, and they they have a wherewithal to go through this volatility, but not easy. Definitely, it's it's, it's not easy. While we are going through these motions, it's not easy. Uh, 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, in the hindsight we look at, maybe we would say, gosh, 2022 was the good time to buy uh, the stocks. Yeah, we can't say that just today. Sitting right now, it's very difficult uh, to go through that motions. Steve sold some puts on Friday. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I don't think... I. I uh, I had uh, started um, adding, you know, putting more money uh, two months ago uh, around the June time frame. And uh, so right now I'm not adding anything. 
but still my hedges are on just reduce the hedges if i see the market going up but uh, yeah it's a, it's always a good time to be in the market at least from my perspective so what we're going to talk today is uh want to talk a little bit about index trading um those uh, who have been you know joining the sessions for some time uh, you would know that this year i started to put more focus around indices um and use indices for my hedging trades and you know reduce uh, spys and qqqs but rather look at spx ndx and rut's so do want to share um now I spend a few months uh, uh, doing that do want to share a little bit thought on uh, indices trading a uh, trading how is it different from stocks or ETFs? What are the things that we need to be aware of if we want to do, um, you know, if we want to play with indices? And uh, so that's one topic. Uh, I also want to talk about the, one of the um, acquisitions that happened recently, um, uh, which is Figma. I want to uh, dig a little deeper into Figma Adobe acquisitions because. Uh, it just killed Adobe shares. Um, sorry if you are one of our Adobe shareholders, but uh, market just didn't like it. So I want to do a little, uh, you know, a double click on that acquisition. And uh, we'll also look, uh, do a deep dive into company Boston Omaha. So anyone heard of these companies or is a shareholder of this company? No, 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 uh, all right. So that will be a new learning for all of us. Uh, even I don't uh, hold shares in uh, Boston, Omaha. I've never uh, spent time or, or you know, looked at Boston, Omaha before, uh, before uh, this. So we'll go through that together. Seems to be a steady, steady, interesting business, right? I say, come on, Qualcomm is getting into auto market, but ARM is doing it up for IP infringement and cancel Nuvi license. Oh, uh, I didn't, I didn't know that. Uh, but Qualcomm and had also uh, they recent had a tie up with uh, with Zuckerberg for some stuff on uh, Metaverse. So uh, we'll see how that uh, pans out. Right now, nothing Meta is working <laughs> for. Uh, for Zuckerberg, uh, if you look at the meta shares itself are under pressure, I guess they are what, down uh, 50%. If you look at meta, yeah, meta is now hitting at 140. It's almost um, the same, uh, the, like COVID level. We're almost reaching to that March uh, 20, um, March in 2020, when we had that big COVID crash. So Meta itself is not working right now. Uh, I think, uh, again, advertising is being challenged and a lot of uh, investment that Mark Zuckerberg and the Meta has to do to make Metaverse work. Uh, people don't have patience. I mean, that's a that's a bet on a future. No one knows how that will pan out. But interestingly, I did see some companies uh, actually hiring for metaverse managers so so that's uh, you know if i recall 20 years ago they'll start to hire website managers from there will become social media marketing coordinators or social media managers and now we are seeing companies started to hire for metaverse managers so i don't know if this is the what you call as a top or maybe this will be a signal for you know hey this is how the world will be 20 years later that metaverse will become common as how the websites are okay. so so there's a leap of faith on the metaverse side still at least that's what i think um ar vr ar i can still understand but uh yeah maybe i'm of a different generation so not my cup of tea but uh, i do want to keep eye on metaverse um 
Zuckerberg want to focus on metaverse. He doesn't want to have the you know left behind like he like he was when it came to mobile. So uh, Steve says uh, the concept of metaverse and Meta's visions uh, are not clear. Uh, so I think at least uh, I don't know. I mean, at least Zuckerberg really want to be the leader, especially in terms of setting up the platform. Uh, for metaverse but what products they'll build out i mean they're trying a few products uh let's see which one uh, will be successful and we'll see light of the day uh, i mean it's too early to talk about that anyway so we'll see all right so with this let's uh, get into today's uh, session all right uh, as always there's nothing we discuss here is investment or financial advice you guys should do your own due diligence not just here anything you hear anything related to finance don't take anything by face value all right uh, let's start with the macro i mean this was a i think this image is shows exactly what the traders on day to day are facing with we're trying our best to stay alive, to stay active. And I think, um, again, uh, the biggest um, takeaway or the biggest thing that one could focus on is how not to get wiped out in this market, right? There are, and it's not just a retail investor. I mean, this is one, this is one area where in, even we have seen hedge funds taking unusually big bets that worked out great when the markets was fav you know favorable but then gets wiped out uh, when we enter into these bear bearish market or bearish trends we don't want to put ourselves in a position wherein when there is a bloodbath in the market i know this is you know it's the best time to buy it uh, but we ended up in you know, other side wherein oh, oh, come on it's not working i need money we sell off our portfolio and move out uh, that's the worst thing we could do as an investor is to is to just completely shut our, ourselves out of the market and that too at the worst possible time and so yeah so if you are still in the market congratulations you are few of them and uh, going through you know this this is what the baptism by fire for investors is so uh in the uh, this time will also pass i mean this is not the first time and this is this won't be the last time when markets will behave uh, the way they are behaving right now <clears throat> but hang in there hang in there i'm also there with you um, we're there during the bull markets we'll be there during the bear market we'll be there when the markets are going sideways uh, not gonna go anywhere a uh, must said web 3.0 is a scam yet he bought bitcoin i don't know if it was a must uh, but jamie diamond definitely came and uh, um talked about uh, bitcoin and and it's you know ponzi scheme um <clears throat> so i haven't sure about musk but yeah tesla still holds uh bitcoin they did sell off a little bit of a bitcoin uh um, during the previous qu quarterly results they mentioned again we don't know what else they are doing with the bitcoin but even the bitcoin is not doing any great uh, anything which is associated with risk is just down i mean if you look at investors are just not buying so this is becomes all uh our s 500 look at a crypto side okay this shows what five minutes no let's look at uh, oh, crypto ads is still better i mean btc still around 19k hasn't lost as much as some of the other you know the the, the drop that we saw on nasdaq so but overall it is still down we are it used to be what 67 was all-time high so all the risk assets are down it's a risk off mood in the markets a greed always trumps fear in the long run 
Right, so but I think both greed as well as fear both are uh, not good for us as an investor. And I think it is important for us to understand uh, when uh, uh, to understand and acknowledge these two these two traits. So one thing which at least this year I started doing uh, and to train myself, I started doing was not to sell the stock when it is red on the day and not to buy it if it is green for the day. I'm like, okay, let's start small. If I have something on my watch list and I want to buy it, I will buy it on the day on which the stock is red. Just as a personal level, I just want to train myself to go against, you know, to, to, to be mentally prepared to buy when others are fearful, right? So as a baby step, this year I decided that I will buy the shares or, you know, if I want to make, uh, oh, uh, add to my position, I will add to it when the shares are down. So, so this year I actually got to buy to add, you know, a, a lot more long stock position in my portfolio. Um, and hope, and my idea is if I want to sell it, I'll wait for it to be green. Of course, on the option side, I um, it's different. I will still hedge the positions uh, using options, uh, but I'm just training myself. A little bit of a mind training uh, so that I not get carried away by what's happened today in the market. It is it is difficult, but I'm just trying to train myself saying, oh, it's a red day. Yeah, I'll sell it. Okay, it's on my selling list. I'll wait, you know, when it, it's green. It, it may happen that today it's $100. And tomorrow it is 80 and then afterwards becomes 90 and I might sell at 90. It's okay. But I, it's more for me. It's more of a, how do I train myself to, to not be carried away by what's happening in the market. Steve, someone did a study many years ago about buying only on red days. Oh, okay. I, I don't know, but I just want to you know, learn something new and, uh, and uh, in this market. I do want to train myself not to sell when it is red and, and uh, you know, not to buy when everyone is now suddenly buying behind, uh, going behind a particular stock. Just a small exercise. All right. So overall S&P sector overview, uh, not good at all. Um, you know, again, I'm looking at just one, one week. It's almost overall S&P is down four and half percent the biggest one is energy right the recession fears not just on the u.s side but overall all the central bankers have raised interest rates all of them and uh, so there is a fear around maybe though you know we could have a recession um, spread across the world and hence the energy uh, you know, if economy doesn't produce much, then we'll, we'll have a less consumption of energy. And that did show up in all the energy uh, stocks going on. Oil was, in fact, back to, uh, I think, pre-Ukraine-Russia uh, uh, situation. The crude is back, back at that level. Uh, consumer discretionary, uh, again, when you have a, a fear of recession, you won't run out and buy the expensive stuff you'll of course we'll have to spend on something which are mandatory so discretionary won't, won't go real estate not doing any good either uh we look at uh company op uh open door they are into trouble so we'll touch base on real estate yeah overall uh this week not that great but it is just one week so what happened we had a hawkish fed and <laughs> And again, this surprises me. Fed has been telling for, for months that they'll do 75 basis point increase. 
And uh, I don't know, was it algos? Was it hedge funds? Are these institutional uh, investors? Are these big billion dollar traders? What do we have a, uh, um, our heads in the sand? And we thought that they won't do it. And then when Fed comes and say, oh, we're going to do 75 basis points and markets just crashes. I don't know what, what's the market expecting. Yeah. And it, I think in between uh, when uh, the announcement came out and uh, Jerome Powell came for an uh, interview, markets actually went higher and then went lower. So it's, it's, it's so difficult to, you know, to make any decision based on day-to-day -day stuff. And that's why I just don't like uh, changing decisions or, or focused on what's market going to do in next one week. We just can't do it. And especially, um, you know, people like me, I mean, who are not full-time into this, I mean, that's a losing game anyway. So, <clears throat> but in any case, so we had a second week of pronounced losses. Fed says, oh, we're not going to do anything. Uh, uh, we're still going to be really hawkish. We continue to increase the uh, the interest rates until we see any change uh, in, in inflation outlook. And I think someone has done a comparison of uh, Jerome's uh, statements, opening statement, which happened uh, 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 after uh, recently, you know, this week to the one which they had done the previous uh, announcement. And it looks like he used exactly the same words, except the numbers got changed. So Fed has been very consistent in their messaging on what they want to do. A uh, different thing is markets sometimes think, oh, maybe Fed will change. Fed will pay that. Uh, but it is what it is. So for now, the short-term interest rates will continue to go sharply higher. You know, over the next few months until they see the inflation, um, you know, <clears throat> coming down. Now, the bigger question is, how much do we believe on Fed? They didn't get, the, previously, they didn't get the inflation numbers right when 400 PhDs in Fed couldn't find out that inflation is not going to be, um, you know, transitory. So, they continued to have a loose monetary policy, continue to um, you know, increase the liquidity. And now, I don't know whether how much should I believe on Fed forecast of, you know, we'll continue to have this tightening over 2023, 24, 20, I think 2023. They couldn't get it right on one direction. What's the confidence that you guys have that they'll get it right on the other direction? Right. It may be a pendulum that is swinging too far on either side. Who knows? We have no idea. So it's a, it's only after every month when after FOMC meeting, we come and say, okay, what Fed has done? And then the markets will just swoon uh, based on that um, reaction on what they might think. You know, Fed is saying what could... So look at a Fed dot plot, right? Uh, they're projecting this is what we'll do in 2023s and 24, right? Go back and if you look at the same dot plot and their Fed expectations in you know 2020 about inflation, it's all wrong. They couldn't get anything right. So I, I don't even know. And that's a you know, when some of my friends ask, hey, you you look at the markets, what what do you think? I'm like, I have no, no answer. And that's the worst thing, you know, for because people expect an answer. They think that. If you, if someone who gives an answer is really, you know, knowledgeable or understands the market, but guys, I'll be honest. I don't think I know what Fed is going to do. Even Fed wouldn't know what Fed is going to do. It all depends on what markets will, will be at that point of a time. Right. So in any case, short term, we saw markets going down treasury yields got pushed higher two year is yielding now 4.10 percent right way better than some of the you know many of the almost most of the stocks so 4.10 percent uh yield on two year uh, which is highest since 2007 and 10 year is 3.77 percent now question that 
I have. I, I know there are I bonds which are paying 9.62 percent. Uh, how do an individual investor buy, let's say, 10 year treasury or this two year treasury? Has anyone bought that? So, or can share if you have any experience. I know we can buy I bonds on uh, Treasury Direct, but that I bonds basically interest rate will, uh, the yield will change based on the inflation. Uh, Steve says Fidelity has it. Okay, so I'll check if. <clears throat> Okay, so maybe I'll have to figure out the ticket. So I know TLT is 30 years. Find out what's the 10 year uh, treasure is. Thanks, Steve. Reason is 3.77. Okay, so let's a question. Is an I bond rates interest log when you buy it? No, such an I bond interest rates will change after every six months. So those are based on uh, what the inflation rate is. Uh, so th th there are two components in the I bonds. One is the base rate, then the plus, it's the inflation. So base rate is very low. So whatever we are seeing is 9.62% is because the inflation is high and those will get reset after every six months. So those, those interests are not logged in. So right now, I think the current one is offering 9.62%. T-R-E-A-S-U-R-Y, Treasury Direct. Yeah, so 9.62 uh, through October, and uh, then there will be reset in the interest rate based on, uh, you know, what's the inflation numbers are. Ross, current limitation, uh, inflation due to supply side, uh, that is true. Fed act, but Fed can't control the supply. The only thing they can do is to kill the demand. So. Um, uh, and that's what Fed is trying to do. Maybe just reduce the demand. But I think what the, the fear is that in trying to reduce the demand, are they going to plunge the economy into recession? Or worse, it has stagflation, wherein the inflation is still high and uh, and the markets or, or the economy is not growing. So uh, fortunately, Fed has no control on the supply side. So only one tool which they have is to control the monetary policy. And what they're trying to do is to maybe let's reduce the demand and see if you know less demand until you know supply chain comes back uh, on online. So yeah, stagflation will be the worst situation. Yeah, Steve says usually there are minimum number of bonds uh, required. I'm not sure. So if you're talking about I bonds, I bonds is like ten thousand. There is no minimum. Probably if there is a minimum, probably there is very less on I bonds. Um, but they have a cap of ten k plus five k of a backdoor entry through tax refunds per SSN. So still fine if you're not know, depending on a family, you can buy ten uh, k of uh, I bonds for per. A family in, uh, you know, per member in the family. Yeah, ten thousand uh, each calendar year. Plus, there is a five thousand dollars of a backdoor entry. So, if you overpay, let's say if you overpaid your taxes, you could opt to have your tax as a part of your tax refund. You can opt to buy uh, another five k of I bonds through the tax refunds, right? But yeah, be, read through and make sure you agree with, the, you know, you understand the terms and conditions of it because there are cases if you sell it uh, sooner, you lose a few months interest and then you probably are not able to sell it for some duration. I forgot, we covered this whole I bonds in detail uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, so yeah, if you want to do that, may want to go back and look at that session. So that reminds me for one thing, and I, I wanted to do that housekeeping announcement at the start of a session, but uh, I forgot about it, is uh, 
given what's happening in the market i know a lot of uh, investors are struggling so and a lot of you have also asked for you know is this document available where is the recording available so as of today the recording i mean the documents are recording have been available on the website uh, but it was behind the paywall so given the situation what is in the market i want to do my part for for the for you know all of us uh, i'm going to remove it from the paywall starting october month so those a few dozen those of you thank you for for your support so far uh you will receive email uh, from me you know that your subscription will not be renewed you know uh, once it uh, expires for for this month uh, so i plan to open up uh, the access to the document as well as access to these recording sessions those will be available on the website uh, but um, not behind a paywall even if you are a basic member uh, those will start to show up if you go to the page and if you don't know maybe i can if quickly tell what am i talking about uh, that might be helpful one second So just trying to do my part over here uh, is to, 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 just so for example, if you come to this weekly, so, so if you come to member and come to uh, weekly webinars, so all these uh, sessions are available under this, but so far uh, these were behind uh you know pay of all uh and uh so i decided that from uh, next month onward uh i'll basically open it up for everyone so the document that we go through is available plus you also have the recording available right here cool so that's a, a little housekeeping announcement Very welcome. Times are tough. And uh, I know, like I just said, hey, we have done this. You can go back and look at the recording, but then, oh, you don't have access to it. So um, at least, I don't know, for the foreseeable future, I uh, just want to make sure you guys have access to, to all this recording and all the documents. <clears throat> all right. Uh, so there was something, Steve said, bid ask on the asset one bond equal to 1,000 usually asset requires minimum number yeah so i never bought these i because it's 4.10 percent 3.77 percent is attractive but attractive for a reason I, I just want to talk about what the reason is even for i saw my bank account is now online savings is giving me two percent i'm like that's good uh the reason is good is for me for now for uh for me is every year i used to pay uh, extra on my home mortgage just that I want to get rid of it and uh, uh, you know something which I've invest in the markets and whatever is left over I used to pay for my home mortgage now when it is two percent and right now my home mortgage is less than two percent like now it doesn't make any sense because uh, it's a uh, what do you call it? it's it, it's a no risk investment banks uh, online savings account is fdic protected if i put it in a cd today you can get actually three percent three point one five percent on a five-year cd i'm like i'm not gonna pay any more penny extra on my mortgage now uh than what i have to pay as a part of my monthly payments right so now i'm looking thinking for okay what can i do for that money where, where else can i you know park that cash so when I look at look at 4.10%, 3.77%, now that makes sense. Let's uh, let's find out how uh, to move that money, which I, every year I keep aside for principal down payment on my home mortgage, how to use that and maybe put in these treasury notes because they are yielding for more than, uh, you know, my 
mortgage uh, rate. So, <clears throat> all right, I see a lot of thanks. Guys, you're very welcome. I'm just trying to do my own part here. Uh, that, uh, to be fair, those a few dozen subscribers is not a life-changing money. But in any case, you know, I just want to make sure that everyone uh, uh, can benefit from it. But my only hope is that you don't disappear from these morning sessions because, oh, you know what? I can I can get access to the document and can go through the recording later on. <laughs> then it will just defeat the purpose. That that was the only reason why I had to move it behind behind the paywall. It was open earlier, and then I saw people dropping and saying, oh, "Yeah, I'll read it." I'll I'll saw your uh, I you know I'll I'll watch your recording later. I'm like okay that that should be the case. So I hope you'll continue to attend, and we can have more discussions out here, and uh, not just go through the you know like in a corporate setting, right? Yeah, I'll go through meeting notes later. You can always go to the meetings and the Zoom recordings, uh, but it's different when you are in a live sessions. So. So I hope you'll stick around for the live session. Yep, live is the best. Uh, can you touch on Euro dollar and uh, and its decline? So I think the decline is, so there are two things. Uh, Euro dollar is a different concept. So I, I guess Ross, you're talking about the Euro and the dollars as two separate currencies and not, not Euro dollar. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so, Today, if you look at a DXY, uh, which is dollar index, a dollar DXY. Ooh. Dollar has been the strongest in, I think, in the past two or three decades, definitely as compared to Euro. Uh, now, the Euro versus dollar. A uh, euro is, I guess, nine few ninety-seven cents of a dollar. Euro versus dollar conversion. Uh, yes. <clears throat> so it's a ninety-seven cents, which is, I think, first time in what twenty-two years uh, of a euro's existence that. Now U.S. dollar is stronger than euro, and not surprised. Europe is in is in shambles right now. You know, shambles may be a little stronger word, but I think I have the, the feelings are still the same. Uh, energy crisis going around in uh, Europe, uh, and I think the world or the investors are just looking at the safe haven is United States. Um, maybe a surprise because. We, based on U.S., don't feel that way, but the world is still thinks the U.S. is still, uh, you know, from an economy perspective, still the world's strongest economy. And uh, the demand for do dollar being a reserve currency, the demand for dollar is still strong. So it's strong against euro, strong against yen. I think definitely the Bank of Japan <clears throat> bought some dollars to, to help yen. But, uh, yeah, uh, this... I've never traded currency. I've never traded these things, but uh, it is surprising to see the huge jump on the on the dollar side. Ross is euro dollar as in dollars outside the US. Yeah, so I mean, I have a little bit idea about what the euro dollar is and how you know Fed doesn't have a control on that, uh, and uh, but I'm not sure. If, uh, and it's declined. I'll have to see if the euro dollar has been declining. One thing for sure is, especially the few players like Russia, China, uh, they have now started to do more uh, trades with their own currencies or gold. So the, the dollars that were earlier used um, for those trades, of course, that demand has come down, but I haven't. So, Ross, maybe I'll, I need to spend some time to figure out what's happening on the euro dollar side. Is it really on decline and it's by how much? But there are signs in the world wherein the different trade blocks 
that are being created. China had created one around the, on uh, with a lot of uh, Asian uh, uh, countries, uh, uh, what is used to be called some regional cooperation. Uh, I guess we reviewed it months ago, uh, in which uh, China probably deal with um, you know trade in, in yuan and not on dollar. Uh, similarly, of course, Russia doesn't deal in a dollar anymore. So uh, if the demand or if the trade within the dollar is coming down, so there is no reason for, uh, uh, you know, the overall uh, usage of the dollars outside of the US will come down. But I have to look at the numbers. Uh, the um, yeah, I mean, I, I recently I, I didn't come across in terms of any big news, uh, sector. It could be that maybe I didn't pay attention, but something that I can take a note of uh, and see what's happening on the euro dollar side. Such as the later almost never comes. Yeah, I'm guilty of that too. Going back and looking at the Zoom recordings, that doesn't come. Uh, could you please share the link to older videos? Uh, these are interesting. So the link, so if you go to, uh, again, this is not what I do for a living, but uh, when we started doing these sessions, I wanted to have a home for these things. So we created this website, Option Gate. So if you come here and if you uh, register yourself for, uh, so right now, I think if you try to register, um, you'll probably see, okay, not uh, sign up. Yeah, so right now you see uh, these two options. So come October, I'm gonna remove this pro, move everything, this weekly webinar windows and all those stuff uh, will move into the basic uh, side itself. And so once you log in, so right now you could register as a basic, come to members and the weekly webinars. And that's where all these uh, recordings and the documents are available. Uh, but today, if you just sign up for basic, it won't be from, but from October next week onwards, it will be. Okay. So Nishi asked a question, it can go to optiongig.com. Okay. All right, Steve, pay to your mortgage still better if your mortgage is 3% because that is tax free versus uh, T bond and no transaction cost. Yeah. No, I mean, so even though I'm active in the market, this is one conflict which I always go through is on an average, SP returns 8 to 10 percent. You know, studies have shown, I know that, and I believe in that. And then on the other side of my investing mind says, let's pay extra on the mortgage, which is you know less than that. So if you really think as a rational mind, it doesn't make sense, right? And you could accuse me of saying, you know, talking from both sides of the mouth. So, and this is where sometimes being rational versus something which suits you reasonably well, uh, uh, you know, uh, trumps. So it is not a rational decision. I know that. Paying off a mortgage, which is 3%, paying that earlier is not a rational decision. Uh, if I can invest that in S&P 500 and they can make eight to 10% over time. Okay. But it's a reasonable decision for me and for my family who will say, you know, you have a different, I think more for my family is, hey, you are, the sooner you become mortgage free, you have a lot of other options that start to open up. Right? So that's the reason, you know, and again, I, it's not that I'm putting every money that I have available uh, onto, a principal down payment, but we have decided, you know, with my spouse that every year we paid on this extra, and this is what my amortization table shows that will become mortgage free uh, by this time, and that plan works for us. So, 
I will I'll follow that plan. Now, only reason for this from now, I mean, I already paid for this year during early part of the year because um, I had cash available. And uh, so I said, okay, let me pay it off this uh, while I'll wait for the, you know, can invest on the markets later. <clears throat> so for this year, I already paid off that extra payment. So now when I saw that, okay, uh, now the, the rates that we can get in the market risk-free is less than the mortgage. Only one condition I'm gonna not pay is that the money that we put in these, either the bonds or the CDs will be used, will not be used for any other purpose than the house payment. Sorry? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. All right. You can't hear me? No, I, I can hear you. Yeah. You can't hear me? No, I can. Uh, yeah, I can hear you fine. Uh -oh. All right. So so that's the reason. So Okay, let me try. Okay. Right. So that's the reason I'm like, okay, let me, uh, you know, help to sleep well. It keeps me still on the same path that uh, I charted for myself. Yeah, I can hear you. So, so that's why now I'm thinking, okay, hold on of paying that principal down payment. All right, I'll have to mute you because it looks... Others can hear me? Okay. Oh, all right. Okay, now I understand what was going wrong. Okay, sorry. Looks like my, now I heard my daughter was in the other room. Looks like she was connected to the Bluetooth speaker. Uh, and maybe one of her friend was saying that they can't hear me. <laughs> my apologies. I was saying that maybe someone in, in this group was saying can't, can't hear me. So now I overheard my daughter saying, oh, I can hear you, I can hear you. All right. <clears throat> okay, uh, getting back to this discussion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I just said that debt-free is financial for many people. It doesn't make financial sense. One is buying peace of mind. Exactly. I mean, uh, and so that's exactly what I'm doing. And I, I was talking to my spouse yesterday. I told her that, you know, I'm going to put this money, which we were supposed, you know, are holding up for our uh, uh, next year uh, house down payment. I'm just going to put it in a CD or buy some bonds. And this will use only for that purpose. Yeah. Not gonna throw that on uh, our vacation. So for vacation, there will be a separate thing. All right, so uh, continuing our discussion. Yeah, so I will have to find out like 4.10% or 3.77 10 uh, year uh, treasury note. I'll probably buy one and hold it for 10 year. Uh, and then once 10 years is done, Paid of uh, you know put it under for house down uh, for house payment. Notice I've always taken money out of mortgage when every time I have refinanced. Uh, yeah, but I have not done that. I don't want to be in a situation uh, again different profile. I'm a little conservative uh, when it comes to uh, investing. I'm a little conservative, so I've never taken out money uh, from a house to put it in the market. Anyway, so other we know markets are not doing great. Markets are in turmoil. How about the safe haven? Right. Gold traditionally is a safe haven. Gold isn't doing good either. So, and I read an article on Wall Street Journal, and this is how the gold has performed this year. This is almost down nine percent. The even the outflow, the you know this inflow versus outflow. Well, the markets have been in turmoil. We are also seeing a lot of money flowing out of gold. So if investors are not buying gold, where are they heading to? So again, the some of the study uh, done by Wall Street show that money is flowing into the bonds as well as into you know dollar purchases, and especially the when the Fed have increased the interest rates, gold doesn't seem to be a hedge 
against the markets. And this is a very different, uh, I mean, it's a different learning for me because I do hold gold in my portfolio. And if it is, if it only act as a hedge to your stock portfolio in a low interest rate environment, not in a high interest rate environment, then uh, have to do something about it, right? Um, over, and I think there was one more chart, but but that was an interesting uh, study for me is because I've been, I've been looking into what's happening to the gold, not totally, but when I look at my GLD holdings, I've been selling covered calls on GLD to reduce my cost basis, but that hasn't performed. You know, you, Generally, you would expect if the markets are down, some of these safe havens will, money will move into those safe havens, but that's uh, not been the case. Ross says gold, silver heavily manipulated since 1971. Okay, I, I'll look at this website, but silver is the same case. Okay. Silver at least have some other industrial uses use, uh, use also. And I can buy a little bit into arguments saying if economy is going down, the industrial usage will come down and hence we expect the silver demand to be low. But from a gold perspective, uh, that's what was surprising. And Steve says all commodities are manipulated. So right now, com even commodities are down. Right? So uh, Ross says dollar is likely to crash. No stable currency moved 16% in a year. I get that, and I I am also expecting this is too too quick, too soon, and now I have started opening positions on uh, on TLT. I right, doing start to so bonds have been out of favor, you know, uh, ever since the dollar start to go high, treasuries start to go high, so they move in opposite directions. Uh, your treasury uh, yields and the and the prices, uh, but now I think I am now start to open up uh, and start to build positions long you know long positions on TLT. Will I get the bottom right? Definitely not. So I think I did my first purchase at hundred and seven dollars. Now it's down to hundred and five. But again, I the way I do it is you know start nibbling it. But I think I do want to start. You know, building position on on TLT. Um, this is the one ticker which I had uh, traded earlier, but I sold it off somewhere 150, 148, and uh, and have never traded back again. But it's, it's a good liquid. It's got options, and I understand the sticker, so I'm planning to get back into this with the hopes. Uh, and I don't know. But you know, if the the race starts to cool down, that should see an uh, up move on on TLD again. Right now, I think it's it's too fast, too quick. Uh, so eventually, it should start to reverse. So that's something new. Um, did this week is a start adding pos opening position on TLT. Right, uh, indices, we are back in bear market. 22.5% down, NASDAQ is lost one third. And uh, if you look at the fear and greed index, we are in extreme fear, right? But two weeks ago, and this is what I picked up from, uh, you know, we didn't meet last week, but we met on September 9th. We were at 45 and suddenly what a change. Two weeks can make in in the sentiment of uh, of uh, investors or traders from almost neutral from forty five now we're down to twenty four. Okay. <clears throat> How do you enter into TLD uh, options? No, so uh, Ross, when I'm looking at a very starting nibbling positions, it's generally uh, a lot of stuff because I'll I'll start with you know looking at two thousand dollars. Uh, starting with two thousand um, dollar uh, position, so I think maybe I picked up some twenty five hundred or maybe two thousand bucks. So I just bought TLT. I think once I get around uh, fifty TLTs in my portfolio, then I'll start 
from there onwards, I'll start to add um, an iron condor positions. And then, uh, you know, then I'll start with the options on it. But right now, I think I just got 15 or maybe 20 TLTs in, in my account. VIX is flying. VIX, no, I mean, I didn't like really. So based on how much the fear is in the market, VIX actually hasn't done that that much, except I think the last day. But this is, was a little surprising for me that even though the, the, the turmoil that we have seen in markets, VIX has mostly been sideways. It is possible because as we saw in our previous session, the, the many of the institutional investors and hedge funds were already super hedged. And maybe that's the reason why the VIX didn't, I, at this point of time, you know, I'd expect VIX to be above 30, around 30, 35, 40, but VIX wasn't surprised to say that VIX was mostly sideways, uh, except, you know, last on Friday. All right, so now we are seeing a lot of market predictions coming on, right? So Michael Hartnett, and this became very famous, saying at 3,600 will be ground to nibble. 3,300 would be a room to bite and 3,000 will be your time to go. So today we are, we are SPX is, I guess we are 3,600 close to, or 3,693. So we are very close to the June low. Uh, and uh, maybe it's time to nibble if you love this guy. And, but again, the overall idea is still more pain is what, Bank of America uh, analysts are predicting. We are not done uh, here. Might go another 15, 20% down. We also saw Jeremy Grantham. He's expecting maybe he could plunge another 26%. You know, this always gets a chuckle out of me that 26%, how accurately can they predict it? Why not 25? Why not 27? But it's 26%. Then we saw another one talking about Ray Dalio predicts 20 to 25 percent drop in the stock market. So all those legendary investors or the or the fo followed. Okay, hold on. I'll have to go and tell my daughter. Looks like they're still connected to Bluetooth. One second. All right, I'm back. Uh, now I understand not her to be blamed. She was using my laptop. So which is my other laptop, which generally connected to the Bluetooth speaker in my room. And she's like, I, <laughs> she was in a piano teacher class. I said, I can't hear. All right, we're good. Uh, yeah, so Ray Dalio says another 20 to 25% drop. I don't know who to believe. I mean, Ray Dalio also had a $10 billion short position in uh, European market. Uh, two months ago, which he had to cover because it didn't turn out to be right. So now when the markets are dire, we'll see a lot of predictions coming in. And when the markets, let's say soon for another week or two weeks, you'll see the predictions coming in the other direction. So be really careful. You know, these are just news items, not don't make an investing decision based on these things. because however legendary they are, how much ever money they've made, I don't think anyone knows where the market's gonna go. So there's third one legendary investor, right? Howard Marks of Oak Tree Capital. He has a different uh, thoughts about these predictions. So what he has to say, I've been expressing my disregard for forecast for almost as long as I've been writing my memos, which was like since 1993. So he wrote a memo his latest memo uh, on, uh, you know, 
how these any forecast or predictions are completely useless. Right? Now again, Howard Marx is also a legendary investor. So who do you want to follow? So I just trying to ignore it. Uh, any of the forecasters or investors, but stick to our own strategy. Right? So a couple of quotes in his article, uh, there are two kinds of forecasters, those who don't know, and those who don't know that they don't know. Right? And the last one is the, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it's the illusion of the knowledge. We think, and that's why if you ask me where the market is gonna be next week, I have no idea. I might think that I know, but that's my illusion. So for my this weekend reading, I'm going to read through this whole article of illusion of knowledge is uh, from uh, Howard Marks. His memos are legendary in investing community. And uh, so I do a uh, reading you know, when those are out. So for my this week reading, it's the illusion of knowledge. You want to add it? Uh, uh, I mean, this will definitely be a useful to grow as an investor. So let's look at other some charts, news. Uh, again, CPI. Right now, we are all feeling the pinch of a CPI. But if we look at the 10 worst CPI one week market reactions. Right? August, September 74, 1990, June 20, 2002, February 2009, and now this is June and August 2022. If I just focus here, a lot of pain, but if I focus here, uh, markets will do what they do and will recover. Uh, again, will does the past performance guarantees uh, the future? Probably, definitely not, but just give us a trend around companies and economy will continue to grow unless you know we become mad and what we saw Putin talking about nuclear warfare, unless you know we wipe off the humanity from face of earth, the human ingenuity will continue to advance. So overall, the economy will, will continue to advance. These periods will come in. How long each of the period would be, that we don't know. Right. So we got to still invest today with focus on tomorrow. There's another chart, uh, how the stocks perform around recessions. Right. Here's a list of the recessions uh, across, you know, since 1953, how long those, re uh, those recessions have lasted. Now, during a session, how the stocks have performed six months before, and then you know, six months, 12 months, and two years after. So today, technically, we are in recession because we had a two months of a negative GDP gro growth. Uh, but <clears throat> if we look at how the markets have behaved, before recession, uh, you know, they perform worse than how they perform when we are in, you know, uh, when we are just during the recession or after recession. So either we wait for the markets to turn around and, you know, and economy to start growing, or we look at that if everyone is running out for the door, I can find some good bargains uh, in this market and I have my investable capital uh, that I don't need for the next five years, why not stay off the course? You know, just stay on our, stay on, on our course. It is, it is a difficult decision to make, but I think nothing that is worthwhile come easy anyway in life. So somehow you have to train. And that's what I was mentioning earlier that I am training myself to buy on red days and not sell on red days and do the other way around, not buy on green day and uh, uh, just sell uh, on, uh, on green day. All right, uh, what else? So we got a new 52 weeks lows, right? And some of them are 52 week low because they could be bad business. 
but some of them are 52 week low because it's a bad stock so important for us to identify what's a bad stock versus bad business uh we got nvidia intel t-mobile google shopify meta the list is there these are the companies that have made new 52 week lows here right? now if you look at company like google i mean i'm interested in opening positions on google i in fact uh, this year start i already started adding positions on google when it was around 120 or something i mean you let me see what was the Yeah, around 120 or so, somewhere around here, right? You can never time the market, but when it fell on 150, 120, 125, somewhere around that, I started building my position in Google. Uh, it's an amazing company. Look at the balance sheet, look at the amount of a cash that Google generates, which gives a lot of options to Google in terms of what they can do with that money. Why not? Right? Now the stock is 52 week low. Uh, and I understand that right now the market is all scared, but this is a time when we can find the, some of the good businesses at a much cheaper price than they had been. Uh, Ross says Meta looks good here. Yeah, so I already have position in Meta, but I started on Meta a while ago. But uh, so what? I mean, if I pull up my Meta position, uh, I think I started building position meta when it was around two two fifties kind of a uh, yeah around two fifties and then adding position and of course you know selling the calls at uh, selling option premium so yeah so right now my cost basis is okay so not even two fifty it's around two eighty eight is my stock average stock trading price but current cost basis is 220 so 60% reduction by selling premium it's almost 24% uh, reduction in my cost basis but stock is still eluding me still down from where i bought and is down to 150 i got 60 more dollars to shave it off so we'll do that uh, <clears throat> and you know good thing around options is you can you can stay invested in the stock and continue to cut on your cost basis uh, while you wait for the markets to recover. So Sachin has an experiment. Did an experiment for last four weeks. Buy stock for Mang and sell covered call, making 0.5 to 1% every week, 4 to 5% last one month. Maybe a short-term strategy that may work in this bear market till December 2022. I'm considering it is rental income not working loss or primary capital. That's great. So I think someone asked me uh, on some of my long stock positions, which I want to hold for next 10 years, it's just like uh, you buy a house, then it's you don't, uh, as long as the business is still good, I don't want to sell off my stock. And then selling option premium could get. It is we are between, I think, 15 to 20 percent, especially in the current market where the VIX is high. Right now, four to five percent in a month is way too high. Uh, so I'm looking at across my positions while I'm, we wait for the markets to recover, generating income through uh, options, 15, 20 percent is not out of bounds right i'm not claiming to, like you know you see claims on options double your income or those are you can always take those lottery tickets but doing steadily trying to sell options premium uh, against your stock holdings either it could be a covered call or what i also do is to sell a put spread and a and a naked basically covered call as to together Right. It's called Jade Lizard, uh, but it enables me to get more shares at a lower cost basis if the shares fall down. 
If it doesn't fall down, doesn't move much, I reduce my cost basis further. Okay. So there are stocks which I hold in my portfolio. Those stocks have been are down 60, 70 percent because of really high growth stocks. But uh, you know, selling this premium on the options uh, still keep me alive, and uh, I, you know, keep me sane and won't panic uh, and do won't resort to panic selling. Meta is one. Like I said, my average trading price is two eighty eight. Current cost basis is two twenty. Right. Some of the other stocks, uh, one stock which I generally talk about is Jumia, thirty-one dollars. Current cost basis is fifteen dollar twenty cents. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, I've been doing the same, and this year the best strategy has been covered call or just basically hedging is selling the calls against the indices. That if the stock market have not done anything that itself would have given 25% return. But the market or the, or the stocks that I hold, high growth stocks are down. So overall still negative, but you know, a lot of cushion these option premiums give. All right, uh, beyond mid hit all time low, uh, not interested beyond mid, but what caught my eye was the beyond me COO, he bit someone's nose uh, during a fight uh, or, uh, on the college football game. So uh, <clears throat> Dave, uh, sorry, Doug Ramsey is a COO of Beyond Meat, then was arrested for third degree battery. He's been chief operating officer. He was previously with Tyson Foods. So there's a little bit conspiracy theory going around here as well, right? Ben came from Tyson and bringing down now Beyond Meat. I don't know, but I thought it was a little interesting. Uh, next one is I, I buying isn't working. I don't think anyone's buying now. And uh, uh, open door share the results. They lost money on almost half. I think it's forty two percent. Oh, I don't know the number, but yeah, it's if I recall correctly, it's like forty two percent of the homes that they sold. They lost money on that. So <clears throat> for those. Um, so not familiar, I buying is a concept that became wild in 2020 because house prices were going higher. And uh, why not just average real estate investor, but I think the big companies thought that they can just flip the houses and make money. So we saw Zillow getting into I buying. We saw Redfin getting into I buying. Have an open door. There's another one open pad. A lot of startups got into this whole I buying stuff, wherein if I want to sell a house, instead of me going through the real estate agent, trying to, uh, you know, then go through the whole nine years of uh, uh, putting up your house and have those visits and then sell and then pay them 6%. These new companies uh, would make it easier and buy a house directly from you. But there is another study which came up, uh, which says that you, uh, on an average, the money that you get through I buying as a seller is less than what you would have go gotten if you had gone through the traditional route of selling your houses through a real estate agent. But in any case, the bigger point is Zillow, uh, I think, was it earlier this year or was it last year? They realized that they can't make money uh, in house flipping. They shut down their business. A laid off the people uh, in their eye buying business. And then at that point of time, there were discussion like, maybe this is, a, is it a good thing for Open Door that one of the big competitors like Zillow has gone out? Or if Zillow can't figure out with all the data that they have, Zillow has, I think, probably the most amount of data on housing trends in the US. And if Zillow can't figure that out, how to price homes to make money with the level of data that they have, what chance do the other companies have? So there were two thoughts on, uh, on Open Door. The bulls on Open Doors were on the side saying, now Zillow is out. Open Door has got a lot of market to itself. The bears had a different one saying, if Zillow can't do it, how can Open Door do it, right? So looks like, uh, as of today, it's a bearish thesis still playing out. Open Door is losing, they lost, money on almost half of the houses that they were selling in August. 
it is not easy to flip houses. Even for the companies that have got tons of money and got huge amount of data to, to price the houses. Again, the other reason is the mortgage. Nobody is buying houses. It's above 6%. I'm so thankful that I stuck to my guns of uh, just getting fixed rate and not getting sucked into the teaser ARM rates. At this point of time, I, I don't care. This doesn't impact me. Right? But anyone who are, who are on ARMs or they'll be impacted, but anyone, no one will be now buying the homes or trying to do a refinancing if they don't have to. If you bought home in the last one decade, you probably paid less than uh, uh, the 6%. So that whole mortgage business is, um, is in trouble right now. It's a refinance. So anyway, so when I read this, I was reminded of the Zillow whole I buying stuff. Like Zillow is out. Let's see how long open door can sustain. Uh, and the third one is Redfin. I think Redfin is still hard. They are still holding their uh, I buying business. I didn't see or not ever have any news that they sold off. I don't know, any one of you have come across if Redfin has sold it off or they're still holding it. Yeah, do let me know. Then we saw SPAC boom to bust, a Trump like DWAC, after hitting 97 down to 16. We also saw uh, SPAC deals are now being, um, you know, they're not, they are being canceled. If we look at the number of deals that have been canceled uh, in these quarters or this year, uh, almost 40 deals that they wanted to enter uh, for emerging deals. SPACs have canceled it. And the, the biggest news was the SPAC king, Chamath Palahapatiya, uh, whose idea was to create A to Z, 26 SPACs. I think he went up to F, SPAC, IPO, A, B, C, D, E, F. And now this folding uh, two of these packs and giving money back to investors. Um, of course, he will forfeit of millions of dollars of doing it, but it is better to fold this pack and give money to investors than to you know merge with a company uh, which is not doing good. I mean, the markets are tough. There are 500 packs who are looking for companies to good businesses to merge with. And there are not that great businesses around. So the old SPAC mania that we saw in 2020 and early 2021 has now fizzled out. And those companies that went uh, through, you know, came to IPO market through SPAC, one of them was Virgin Galactic. You know, the air has been, oxygen has been sucked out of these companies. And I recall having discussion in a, in a social gathering with folks when they, this was around 29 and how some of the folks were very bullish on this. And of course, I, I, I didn't have any prediction where it will go. But the only thing which I told was, guys, we don't know where the market will go. So if you really want to go in this, you know, sell a put option rather than trying to buy the stocks. Learn about options so you can reduce your losses or give yourself a buffer to be right. right. I hope maybe some of them would have done it. But in any case, I mean, the, the SPACs are in a... Those high-flying SPACs are down. Clover Health was another Chamath Palhapatiyas. It was at some part of a time, it was $29. Now it is close to $2. Oh, oh, the same chart again. SoFi, same stuff. Uh, $28 at peak, now to $5. Open door, we just talked about. Now it's close to $2. So all these SPACs, when they come to IPO, they come at $10. Right? And uh, the number state that how many 
the 2022 class, and I think many of them were actually uh, before 2022, but whatever SPAC companies merged and uh, came to, uh, you know, merged with another company and came to public market in 2022, they are down 48%, whereas the IPO is down 38%. The company that came through traditional IPO route. So raising money in the markets is not easy right now. And even if you have raised money, then people who bought into those uh, uh, IPOs are not doing it good uh, in this market. And right now the IPO market has itself has dried up. IPOs are down 81% from a year ago. But only good news I there was Instacart. They want to plan, they are planning to go IPO, even in this tough market condition, because they want to give an opportunity of liquidity for their employees. Instacart doesn't want to raise any money, but they want to go to IPO so that the employees can sell their shares. And you know, those early employees who got it at a few cents or whatever numbers, they, they have some liquidity available. We'll see how that goes, uh, but it's been a tough market for, for IPOs. IPO proceeds are down 95%. You know, money raised through IPOs is down 95%. So if you are working in a company and were promised that we'll go IPO soon, there may be longer wait than you would have anticipated earlier. So hold on there, have a little more patience. That's all I can say. Right now, the markets are not, they're not looking good for any IPOs. Cool. All right, any question, anything else caught your eye in the market? All right, uh, let's look at the indices. As I mentioned earlier, at the start of a session this year, I, um, wanted to move towards you know using indices for my hedging and reduce using etfs um for hedging right for hedging i uh, in i think earlier i used qqq spy iwm as a hedging instrument and uh, this year i decided i want to move towards indices and use spx ndx rut equivalent bigger in size but use that for my hedging purposes. Right? So the market indices, depending on how the construction of your portfolio is, you can uh, you can do a hedge trade using options against your long uh, portfolio. So I do want to share uh, you know some thoughts around this. So what are indices? If you have not traded on indices, you might be wondering what I'm talking about. So these are the first of all, I don't know what it is called indices or indices. So I will stick to indices. Someone, because uh, English was my is my third language, so not that great on it. So please correct me if it is indices or indices. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, so what are indices? So indices are, uh, you know, what we hear market talking about. SPX is S and P index. You got uh, so these are just the numbers, right? Um, that tells us the health of a particular segment of the market. Now, SPX is an index which tells us around the 500 companies, uh, top five, I think it's 494 something, it's not exact, or it's like four, 504, little more than 500 or little less, but it's generally it's like 500, top 500 companies which are in the standard and poor's uh, S&P uh, index. Then you got IWM, which is your Russell 2000. The companies which are in the Russell 2000 uh, ETF, uh, sorry, RUT. RUT is an index, which is Russell 2000 index, right? 2000 small and medium business segments. Uh, then you got uh, uh, NDX, which is a NASDAQ index. Okay. Now, these indices, you uh, you can't trade, like, like we trade stocks or ETFs, you can't buy or sell these indices. If you look at the bid ask, they are zero, size is zero. 
So you can't buy NDX, you can't sell SPX. Because these are not, there are no instruments uh, that you'll get, you, right? So that's how they're different from stock or ETF is you can't buy units of uh, NDX or units of indices, right? There is no delivery of indices. You can buy ETF, you can sell ETF, you can buy stock, you can sell stock. There are, there are no shares like SP, there are no shares. Only thing you can do is use options against these uh, indices is, you know, based on your outlook of how the tech companies could do or how the S&P market would do, you can trade options on it on these indices, right? Uh, <clears throat> so now these options are different because there are no instrument to deliver. There is no shares to deliver. So these options are all cash settled. So for example, if you have sold a put on SPX, because you think, oh, I think markets are already down not 23%, I think it's too much. It will probably go higher. And uh, in case of a stock or ETF, if you want to acquire the stock or ETF, you, you would sell a put option. And if the stock you know, goes, instead of going up, if it goes down, you can acquire it at a lower cost. In this case, there's nothing to acquire. If you sell and put option uh, on this ETF, it will be cash settled. Uh, or if you sell a put spread based on your, you know, your long and the short legs, only difference that you'll see is in your cash position in your account. So these all indices are cash settled. And these are European type options. Means there is no chance of early assignment. So if you have sold a call, you can't get assigned on this or on it before the expiration date. So there is no risk for early assignment on uh, these indices. And that that's what attracted me is uh, Europe. Because if you're trading on or using QQQ or you're using SPY or any of these ETFs, there is an early assignment risk. You know, if, if you sold a call and the stock has uh, gone higher and it's way in the money, you could be assigned early on it. Or if you sold a put and the stock has fallen down, there is little ex extrinsic value left on it. Even though the expiration date may be 20, 20 days out, you could still get assigned on it. But when you talk about indices, there's no assignment. So you can hold it uh, and, you know, and might wait for it to come back and recover, or if not, you know, it will be eventually cash settled. So these are European type options, means they will not be assigned prior to the expiration date. So how I use this, uh, I use options on it at a portfolio level, and that's what attracted me onto the indices is instead of using ETF, instead of trying to sell, you know, five contracts, maybe I just sell a call spread on NDX or SPX. It's a huge value um, contract. So if you look at XPX, you know, but currently I have this position on SPX. It's a call spread hedging trade, gives me little negative deltas, uh, which this would be, this, so this is 10 times the SPY. If I were to do the same position in SPY, I'll have to sell 10 contracts, but I can do that with a single um, contract on SPX. Right, so this is this gives me negative, almost sixty SPY deltas by this single trade. So I use these uh, for you know managing the overall portfolio deltas, you know, uh, <clears throat> using the options to to manage those deltas. So similarly, I have I think NDX. Do I have it or did I close it already? Oh, I think I closed the uh, 14th October, then opened 21st October, what, yesterday? Yeah, yesterday. So I closed the one 
at profit opened another one. So I use these indices for, for basically for hedging. Now, interesting thing is around the settlements. And this is where I have not still, this hasn't still sunk into me, is that those monthly indices are AM settlement. Because generally, uh, you know, now I'm attuned, saying on a Friday, there's always a, your third Friday of a month is an op option expiration. Ideally, my idea is to get out of all of them before, but not, then I have to keep an eye on it. But when it comes to these indices, many of, uh, so these monthly ones, they are all AM settled. So if we look at it, they'll say it's AM settled indices. Means in the Friday morning, they'll do the settlement based on what's the opening price of that indices, which you don't know. You know, I know where it closed on Thursday, either on a Friday morning, you're up and looking at your screen early morning, uh, but what has happened uh, on overnight could actually surprise you, right? So, but the weeklies and these indices are, you know, many of these indices have very liquid, NDX is not because it's a big one, but, and have a weekly and in some cases almost daily expirations. So if we look at SPX, you have 27, 28, 29, 30th, and of course third, first. So they have almost daily expirations now. I don't do daily. I generally try it when I open a position, especially on the hedging side, I look at, you know, opening it around two to three weeks out and try to close it a week before expiration. So that's, that's again, depending on, how, you know, how much time I have. I don't want to get into the last week because of uh, the gamma risk. I try to close it sooner. Uh, not depending on how much time you have, you may have a different way of uh, doing it, but I'm just sharing what I do. So AM settlements, if you're not, let's say if I don't close it before Thursday, then Friday morning, I may be up for a surprise. Right, and uh, generally every Friday morning we have a we have a, our standard nine seven to nine. I have a long tech learning meeting in our company, and I'm not even looking at the markets at that point of time. Right, so, and I don't want to get surprised. So if you're trading in indices, make sure you close every, especially the monthly expiration. You close it before Friday. Okay. What else? Uh, tax treatment. Now, this is what is uh, the most favorable part of it. I think the second most is you get a favorable tax treatment if you're uh, taking profits on indices or losses, right? So let's say if you, like I said, I do like three weeks out and maybe close the option trade in within two weeks. So it's a short-term gain. If I'm doing it on SPY, excuse me, if I'm doing it on SPY ETF, it's a short-term gain. But these indices come under 1256 contracts in which, let's say if I made $1,000 in that, 60% of it will be taxed at a long term and only 40% of it will be taxed at a short term. So that's got a favorable tax treatment. That was one reason why I wanted to move towards indices, especially when I'm looking doing for my hedging trades. And this year, only trades that I worked out are the hedging trades, right? But thankfully, uh, you know, I don't have to pay the all the tax as a short-term gain. But sixty percent of that would be a long-term gain. So, so that's my experience with indices so far. Uh, so far, so good. I think it's it was only once that uh, I got a little surprised because I missed out that it's an AM settlement, uh, but. I think other than that, um, it's been working out okay for me. Uh, I think one other surprise that I had was, I think I had a 16 Delta. I, I opened up, I think a strangle, not the strangle, but uh, just the naked call. I didn't hog a lot of my buying power. So then I decided to just stick to spreads to limit the buying power because these indices are huge. You know, SPX is like 3,700, right? So now only thing I do, I restrict myself to selling call spreads or, you know, 
if I have to do on the put side, just basically focus on uh, doing the spread and not doing naked, just to to um, reserve the buying power. Otherwise, it will consume a lot of buying power. Okay, so that's all on indices. I know some of you have been trading on indices way more than I have been. So enlighten us with with other uh, things that we should be aware of. Uh, especially as multiple explorations. Yes, now we have a daily settlements. Keep away from EM settlements. Very sane advice. <laughs> I Like I said, I had a surprise one uh, during my initial uh, once I had a surprise. Yeah, settle print price may be different from the opening price. Ooh, okay. Uh, I didn't know that, but I thought maybe they settle it on, on whatever they open it, but yeah, I don't understand those nuances. So my best effort is uh, let's close it before, uh, you know, uh, before the expiration is. Let's close it on Thursday itself. Cool. So that's a quick uh, preview on uh, indices. Generally, retail investors don't uh, trade on indices because those are big. But and of course, you can't buy or you know shares in indices. Only thing you can do is to use options. So which many of the retail investors. Anyway, don't do it. But I find this as much better way. Uh, number one, your brokerage commissions are down because instead of me doing five contracts or 10 contracts of SPY, where I have to pay the brokerage commission 10 times, I'll just have to do uh, one SPX contract. So brokerage commissions are down. Way more important is you get a favorable tax treatment. So now one area where I have a, you know, where I still have to resort going back to SPY is if I just want to reduce my deltas by, let's say 10 delta or 20 delta. In that case, doing a spread to reduce just by 10 or 20 delta uh, becomes a little difficult. Right. So in that case, I'll go. I still go and you know sell a twenty delta SPY, but uh, those are far and few. Uh, but mostly now I'm using uh, for uh, hedging. I just moved most of it to uh, indices. Ramesh, is there a historical chart to learn from? So indices, I didn't learn. I didn't have to learn anything new. Or from an indices perspective, right? If you've been, if I, because I've been trading on SPY, QQQ, and these are just the multiples of that. So I, uh, so from that perspective, I didn't have to learn anything. Of course, the option side that we've been learning for years, uh, we could just apply that to indices also. Other thing to note on, on indices, especially like at SPX is great, but NDX, because it is like $11,000 why? I mean, the, the it's eleven thousand dollars. The bid ask spread is much wider than what you would expect or are used to, right? And in such a big index, you have a little less liquidity. Uh, so if you look at it, they have a four dollar wide bid ask spread. Uh, SPX is a little tighter and has got a lot of. Uh, uh, liquidity uh, also in, in SPX. So if you look at a, you see a lot more contract and a lot more volume on SPX. And the uh, liquidity is also much better than, uh, sorry, the bid ask spread is better than what you're in NDX. But for me, I think overall it's still working out fine. Uh, how can you tell if the option has an AM settlement? Actually, on Think or Same, it will just show you here as AM. And the monthly options have AM settlement. The weeklies don't have it. So Think or Same platform, you could just see it because they will be putting AM in the box. Okay. All right. Uh, let's spend some time on Adobe's Figma, and then we'll jump on to Boston Omaha. That will be the last topic for today. <clears throat> so this happened while uh, I was, because I was traveling last week, and uh, then I saw, you know, markets going crazy over Adobe's acquisition. So Adobe bought Figma. Figma was a privately held company. It's a startup 
uh, yeah, I mean, if the company is not IPO, do you call them a startup? I mean, it's been around for some time. Uh, the company has been around for almost 10 years. Uh, yeah, so whatever nomenclature you may want to give, I have no, <laughs> no issues with that. But uh, uh, they bought Figma for $20 billion. And this is the largest acquisition, the biggest acquisition in history of Adobe. I mean, they bought Dreamweaver, Macromedia, uh, uh, and maybe a few more. Those are the two that I can recall. But uh, they paid $20 billion. And the stock market didn't like it. I mean, they lost 25% of its market value um, when they announced this. I think when they announced it, uh, after e the earnings announcement, you know, after the market closed, it was down some 10%. When it opened, it was down 19%. And the next day, again, it fell down. So overall, it was down 25%. The earnings were good, but earnings took a backseat. Um, most of the concerns and the questions were around Figma. Why on earth, in this point of a time, are you paying $20 billion for Figma? So what is Figma? Let's talk about it. who is this company? Who are the founders? You know, you got to make twenty billion dollar. So if you look at a Figma, so generally it's you know it's not known in a public domain, but it's a company that is or the tools are being used by product managers, UX designers, very popular tool. And the, and the basically this is the SaaS based company. It means you can go and create designs online and share your designs with others. So uh, the whole idea is to collaboratively work. The designers and the product managers can work remotely and collaboratively on a single interface and you know, create the whole designs and the mockups, uh, which earlier they used Adobe's Photoshop to do it. So Adobe is very st strong in this, in terms of creating a mockups uh, uh, with their product called Photoshop. Photoshop has been around for, uh, gosh, I don't know how many generations now, right? So ever since I think I graduated from college, I've been hearing about Photoshop. And uh, uh, during my work, I have exchanged PSD files uh, from an you know agency which was doing the US work for our company product and handing that over to my uh, software designer to make it a clickable and you know, I'm talking about like 10, 12 years, we didn't have Figmas and the envisions of the world by then. And, uh, but anyone, if you are to interact and, and share your designs, UX designs, Adobe Photoshop was the standard, right? You get a Photoshop license, download Photoshop and then do it. Now Figma is in the same space. They allow, um, designers and the users and the product managers to work collaboratively. Yeah. But it's all based on cloud. They have a cloud-based collaboration tools. This was founded in 2012. So it's been around for some time. Right. Anyone of you, if you are a UX designer or a product manager, you probably would have used or would have heard of this, right? General publics don't use this, right? But it's been pretty uh, famous and a loved tool among the UX designers. Okay. But this is how it started. They started in 2012. They didn't know what they want to do till 2015. They didn't even have a product out for 2015. They're just trying to tinker with the product, see what exactly they want to put in the market. And, uh, and they didn't sell or make any money, didn't even monetize it till 2017. So five years since the founding of company, the seed investors or series A, B, whatever the, uh, you know, the in VCs had to have that patience for five years of not company, not even trying to make money. For three years, they didn't even have a product that they can bring to market. Still trying to struggle with product market fit. Uh, what's the transaction detail? What is Adobe paying it for? Like I said, it's $20 billion, half in stock and half in cash. 
So look, cash is itself is ten billion dollar cash. Right. Eight, Figma mentioned they have an ARR, which is the annual recurring revenue, is around four hundred million dollars. Now, for a four hundred million dollar annual revenue, you're paying twenty billion dollar. This is fifty times multiple. We are not in twenty twenty anymore, guys. 2020 is over. I've seen crazy valuations in 2020 uh, in terms of multiples. Now those multiples have been compressed, right? So those uh, so are watching markets, why people, some of the analysts say that markets are still to fall down because today till now, what we have seen is multiple compression. The next phase, what the analysts are saying, we're going to see the earnings reduction. So market, going down because of earnings reduction is yet to happen. But multiple compressions have already happened. That's why all the high growth stocks that had enjoyed huge multiples in 2020, in 2021 are now down because the multiples have been compressed. And here is Adobe paying 50 time multiple of this company. Even if you look at a historical perspective, this company was valued $10 billion last year. Now you tell me any other startup companies which were the value last year and are valued like double this year. I can't recall much. Right? If you look at uh, uh, some of the companies, uh, which was like, mm, not Stripe, there is another company uh, which was like valued $40 billion last year, uh, uh, Klarna. They were valued $40 billion last year. Now they're struggling to get a billion, uh, you know, $10 billion of valuation. Uh, any of these uh, 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 SaaS, not profitable, high growth companies, all the valuations have been cut down as compared to last year. But whereas Adobe is actually giving them Double the valuation. Mark is that's why market reacted the way they had. Right? Is because what, what the heck is going around here? Why are we paying through our nose to acquire a company? Why are we giving them double the valuation that they had last year? Whereas if you look at the current status of SaaS valuation, right? High growth companies, which means are growing more than 30% year over year, their multiples are 10, let's say 11 times. High growth companies are 11 times. And whereas Adobe is paying 50 times. So what gives? You know, like I said, multiples were crazy last year, but have come down. All Adobe is doing is paying for a growth. If we look at this company, I mean, high growth is again, uh, I, I don't know, what should we call it? A rocket fuel growth. They so started in 2020 till 2024, they were R&D, didn't have a product till 2015, did a private beta, $0 made. 2016, public launch, $0. 2017, they made 700K. 2018, 4 million, which is like six times. 2019, 23 million, grew 5X. 2020, of the base of 23 million, they grew 3X. 2021, again 3X. 2022 is, are they saying close to 400 to 450 million? So this is a darling of VCs, right? Generally, look at a VC, they have a three, uh, three by three, two by two. You grow your revenue three times three years or three by two, two by two. I'm not a VC, so I may not be getting that exactly right, but uh, they do have some similar metrics saying three by two, two by two, or three by three, two by two, which means you grow your revenue three times in the first three years. And then at a new base, you start to growing it, like doubling your revenue. Uh, for another two years, you're a great company. That's what, uh, you know, uh, makes it as, as, as a great investment for, from a VC perspective. So this company had done it. 
the growth has been exponential. And now at a $400 million or $450 million base, next year, the projection is like 800 plus, again doubling. And there were gross margins of 90%. So they are doubling, uh, but you know, at, at a decent gross margin. They also have a net dollar retention of 150%. Not many companies enjoy this high uh, dollar retention, except maybe Snowflake. I don't, I'm not aware of any other public company which with such a high uh, net dollar retention. Many companies are around 120 to 130. Snowflake had at some one point of time 170. I don't know what the latest Snowflake results are, but wouldn't be surprised if Snowflake is at the same level. Huge, big dollar retentions. Right? And now there are 4 million users. And looks like it was eating Adobe's biggest lunch, which is their Photoshop. So, like Naresh says, Adobe sucks at SaaS. Uh, it's a preemptive strike. It is a preemptive strike. Figma may not be worth $20 billion to, let's say, Microsoft. But for Adobe, they buy this bullet and they've taken out one of their biggest competitor out of the market. Right. They, Figma had started to eat lunch of Adobe. Photoshop had become Facebook for uh, for uh, you know, in the design world, means it is used by a certain uh, demographics. Um, my kid says, like Facebook is for parents, not for kids. And Figma is the Instagram. So all younger generation, newer designers. I mean, in fact, I have uh, you know some of my ex colleagues. He actually was a designer and then he started his own designer recruiting form. And when I saw this, I saw his update on the LinkedIn and he was like frustrated saying that now Adobe has bought Figma and they're gonna ruin Figma now. So he runs a designer recruiting form. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this is pretty famous among the newer generation on, uh, and right now it's a very steep price. That they have to they had to pay to to acquire them now <clears throat> and Barkers didn't like it so what are the concerns there could be anti-competitive regulatory risk i hope lena khan is looking at this and say that if adobe takes out figma what who else are left you know once adobe takes this out all they need to do is to make it free to kill, you know, other some of these companies, the Canva and Sketch. I've used Canva. I have used Canva. Canva is again a design uh, software that many of SMBs used or individual users use, like I use. Um, I used because now it's giving errors. I don't know. Maybe because I'm on a free tier, they want me to force to. Uh, get a paid subscription and anytime I try to paste anything Canva, it just can't save the design. So, but I'll see. But uh, again, Canva was uh, last valued at, I think $10 billion or 20. Canva valuation. Forty was when July 2020. Okay, now let's say it's 20, by July it's 26 billion or whatever. Like, let's cut to be 20 billion dollar, given the multiple compressions that we have seen. Now, what the executives Canva might be thinking? Gosh, uh, you know these guys could fetch 20 billion dollar. Are we worth 20 billion dollar? Or are they thinking the other side? They're sweating. Because now Adobe can just give this uh, Figma for free and then put pressure on Canva and Sketch and whatever other startups and just you know kill them. 
just like what Microsoft is trying to do with the Slack, with the Microsoft Teams, but they can just bundle it and give it Teams for free. And that is why Slack had to then go under Salesforce so, because it's almost impossible to compete as a standalone company when the your competitor is just giving it out for free. So Salesforce had to go under Mark Benioff under the bigger balance sheet of, uh, of say, sorry, Slack had to go under a bigger balance sheet of Mark Benioff and Salesforce. You know, otherwise they wouldn't have survived. So maybe my, my thinking is maybe the, the, ex, the board room at Canva is actually looking at some similar moves saying now they have to, earlier they were competing against Figma. Now they have to compete against Adobe, which can just give Figma software for free to the customer use base because they can make money on the other softwares. So interesting one, there are uh, thoughts on both sides saying some people say maybe this is a short term really really bad move because you're paying through your nose it shows the desperation that adobe uh, boardroom has and the fear that they had on you know what figma could do for them they just couldn't looks like they couldn't compete i know adobe had been all i know adobe actually uh, created a lot of the subscription saas subscription software, probably nowhere near as good as Figma. Okay. And they decided rather than, you know, trying to build everything from scratch, let's buy them. Shows sign of desperation that they had to pay twice, but Figma may be more, let me put it this way, Figma may be reasonable to Adobe's business at $20 billion and maybe super expensive to, let's say Microsoft, at fifteen billion dollars, right? It depends on who can drive the synergies. So for them, in long term, it might be in uh, you know uh, work out much better. Again, it it's only in long term. We don't know what could happen in uh, in one or two years. But I think the move was to just swoop in, kill the biggest competitor, and move on. T you know, take the pain one time and move on. But so let's look at Adobe, right? They have to pay $10 billion cash, $10 billion stock. Stock has already fallen down 25%. So now that $10 billion is worth whatever, 7%, uh, 7.5%, right? Uh, so let's look at Adobe p and I think from a, their general business perspective, Adobe is still Fortress. Their business is still doing fine. It's just that they were the growth um, was a little tapering down. Number two, the future threat from Figma was really high. So what they're looking for is Adobe we made in our most recent quarter 4.4 billion dollar of revenue. So around uh, let's say. $18 billion run rate, and out of $4.4 billion, they have $1.36 billion of net income. So $18 billion run rate uh, the, from their assets perspective, they got 3.8, 1.8, close to six uh, or $5.5 .5 billion in cash equivalents and short-term investments. So $5.5 .5 billion they have. Uh, cash flow perspective, how much money do they bring in? Uh, $1.7 billion per quarter. So th th this is a business that generates around $6 billion plus of cash flow every year. So $10 billion of cash from a finance perspective, not too big a burden on it, right? But they'll still raise a debt to finance the deal. And I think Adobe can raise a debt at a, at a good uh, rate because the overall business is strong, right? 
but it will also dilute shareholders because they have to issue, um, I guess they're gonna, gonna issue more 6 million stocks to give it to uh, Figma employees. So they, they will dilute their shareholders. So <clears throat> I think they have the balance sheet. They, uh, they have the money and they can raise the money to pay for this. But we have to see how, I mean, Shantanu has been doing great on Adobe. Uh, and I guess he will he'll be able to make a good use of it. Like Salesforce has done good with acquisitions so far. Slack, we still have to see, but their previous acquisitions all have worked out well. Uh, so we know Mark Benioff is a serial acquirer. Can't be said the same about Shantanu, uh, CEO of Adobe, but I mean, he, he, he's been a, one of the great good CEOs in the Silicon Valley. So hopefully it'll work out good for them. So Adobe at some point of a time was around 600 plus. Adobe, it's almost $700. So if you think, now it's at like 280, down 60%. So if you think it's a short-term pain, not as bad to where it was pre-COVID. And if you thought, oh, I missed the boat when the stock went up from 250 to all the way to 700, lo and behold, the boat has arrived. You can hop onto the boat now. It's okay, it arrived uh, two years later, doesn't matter. It's back at its price where you were, you know, if you thought you missed the boat, there we go. The train is back on the platforms. So you can board the train again. Uh, I think right now, short term, definitely market didn't like it because it is, you know, whatever we may, we may say, it is a very expensive acquisition, but they have to make it worth the amount that they are paying for it. Okay. And uh, maybe it is worth it because it was eating Adobe's, Adobe's lunch. Uh, so, so time to buy Canva. Canva is not uh, public, so you can't buy it. Uh, Naresh says, WhatsApp got bought by $20 billion. Uh, those were the crazy. So I think getting $20 billion when you could raise uh, money at 0% interest rates. But again, uh, I think that I still feel that was a good buy because a lot of monetization possibilities are there on WhatsApp. It'll just going to take longer and longer term. I mean, it's going to take a long time. Sam said, Kramer said, buy Adobe at $600 a year, uh, a year ago. Oh, he'll change his statement. I mean, that's what Kramer does. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't believe on Kramer anymore. Uh, he, he flows with the market. I mean, nothing right or wrong. He's an entertainer. He gets paid for $5 million to host the show. Makes a lot of money through that. So, so good for him. But that doesn't mean we should blindly follow Kramer. A Singaporean super investor was proud his daughter's first purchase to be 460. Can play options. Yeah, I mean, it's pity that people just blindly follow. Compare Google buying YouTube. They know what to, exactly. Uh, so that's what I'm saying. Figma may be more useful to, to Adobe at $20 billion, might be reasonable and may not be reasonable for other company even at $10 billion. They won't know how to make money out of this. But this is in Adobe's backyard. Now they got this whole Figma coming into their backyard, trying to attack their house. They just want to, get rid of it. Microsoft bought Nokia. No, uh, yeah, that was because the Microsoft wanted to get into phones. Uh, didn't really pan out the whole hardware stuff. I think the only hardware stuff that had worked out in the recent times was their Surface tablet, uh, which I think even at least this quarter, that was also seeing some difficulty. But other than that, I think other Microsoft phones, etc., nothing worked out. Yeah, Canva is private. Yes. To, to, to. Isn't it funny that corporations acquire other companies to protect long-term assets of the company? 
but they don't like it when the interest rate goes up to protect the long-term economy. Everyone is selfish. Uh, so I, I won't blame uh, the CEOs. I mean, if you can get it for free, why not? Every day, ask for it. And Xbox, yes. Oh, yeah, that's on the gaming side. Yeah, I, I, I don't even play any games, so easy to miss out for me. Xbox has been success, very true, and uh, their Surface line of tablets have been good. Cool. So that's around Adobe. Uh, to me, I don't hold Adobe uh, in my portfolio. But I'll put it on my watch list because right now I'm in a focus to reduce the number of tickers. But if I would buy it, maybe I, I might look at Adobe. Because other than this, um, the rest of the business and the balance sheet is rock solid. So anyway. You can make your own decision based on what you hold in the rest of your portfolio. Guys. All right, let me say some more. Let's come to the last topic for today. We are seven minutes over. Probably we'll take another 15 minutes. So appreciate you staying over. And uh, let's go through a company called Boast. Boston, Omaha. Uh, I did a poll earlier. Has it, anyone heard of it? Well, I said, nope, nope, no one heard of this one. So let's find out what this company do. Okay, let me just bring up this Boston, Omaha document. Give me a moment. Boston, Omaha. Alrighty. <clears throat> like I said, uh, disclaimer, I don't own the stock. Uh, zero positions on this one. So, yeah, now it is 26. I mean, I only started reviewing it, uh, I think, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, that time it was $26. I have no position yet on the company. So what he does, it does nothing. It's a holding company. So remember uh, a previous session where I was talking about, we're gonna talk about mini Berkshire. This was the company, but Berkshire doesn't do any, I mean, Berkshire is also just a holding company of bunch of other companies, right? So this is what uh, I'll call a, a mini Berkshire uh, is that it's a holding company. It doesn't produce anything uh, of its own, but it, own multiple businesses in it, right? So they have four businesses. They are into broadband, billboards, right? Not the fancy one, but the plain old, uh, the static painted big billboards. They're into bonds and asset management, right? So now, Within the asset management, they have a minority holdings on, you know, home building, aviation infrastructure, real estate, and all that. So just like Berkshire has, uh, Berkshire own uh, some businesses completely, and some businesses they have, they are major, you know, own a lot of shares in like Bank of America, Amex, Coca Cola, et cetera, et cetera. So this uh, Boston Omaha on a similar one. So let's look at some of their businesses. One is a billboard, static billboards, right? Not LED types, not Wi-Fi connected, but the ones which you see on the highways, on the side of the highways. These are the stuff that doesn't grow at 30%, 40%, right? These are the, what do you call as a, as, as a previous generation businesses, right? 2021, they grew only 6.4%. Overall, they, uh, so how about, let's see, uh, what we want to see is, yeah, the main thing is it uses $47 million of capital and generate 
one million dollar per month of cash flow. These are the like a buffet like businesses, which are not fancy. They don't grow like crazy. They're not the latest tech businesses, but from a business point of view, from a cash flow point of view, and today's world cash flow is the more, most important, right? Uh, market is not looking how quickly you're growing. Are you making money? Do you, are you cash flow, right? So, and this company uses $47 million and generated one month, one million per month of a cash flow, right? It, it's a it's a great business because the the cost is almost fixed. You got your land, and the you know uh, to put up those uh, boats. That's the biggest cost. Beyond that, it's a just overhead, which is around eight percent, eight eight and a half percent. Right? That too. They have been reducing their overheads. <clears throat> so from a business perspective, this is a cash flow generator business for Bostonoma. Now they also have is a broadband. So they got a regional, so they are focused to provide broadband accesses in rural economies where you don't have, you know, the, the other big national players. So they are in Utah, Utah Broadband, they got Airbeam, InfoVest. Now below is a breakdown of some stats from 2021. Overall, 2020 revenue was 3.8 million. Now it is 15.2 million, uh, close to 20K subscribers. And initial cost is high because you have to lay those uh, you know, fiber cables and all that. But it's again a very low maintenance and it's a captive consumer base. Consumers in these areas don't have uh, much options for internet. If there is one, there are hardly many, you know, players who provide broadband internet over there. So from an um, ongoing cost perspective, Ongoing cost is less, but they have a steady revenue uh, coming along for years to come. So what they're also doing is to work with the builders to set up broadband in the new home. So they have a, another collaboration called Fiber Fast Homes in which they work with the builders uh, and uh, to set up the, the, the internet in a new home. And beyond that, then every month, basically they just collect uh, payment checks for, for uh, the internet connection from the residents. Again, the initial uh, fixed cost, but then recurring revenue for quite a long time without any uh, more additional investments. They are all also into bonds, right? This is again more of an insurance company, uh, which is uh, a surety bonds. From a performance perspective, uh, just a bit. <clears throat> on the overall control premium uh, was you know five point five million dollars. So they they wrote nine point three uh, dollar worth of premium control premium, which is what's the true cost was five point five. Uh, from their perspective, I think it's still a one dollar premium can produce 40 cents of uh, profits uh, around uh, at, a, at scale. So over time, again, not a very fancy business, ins but insurance business give them an opportunity to also uh, enjoy that float when they collect the premium. And then you can use that float to invest into other companies. Now this is a very specialty, uh, uh, you know, insurance. This is a surety, which means if you are working for a contractor, and the contract, so contractor will uh, have to furnish kind of a surety insurance that if they do don't do their job, there's someone who's guaranteeing or giving you surety that, you know, if the contractor doesn't do it, you'll be compensated for it. 
So that's a specialty kind of a business that uh, uh, this uh, group, general indemnity group is in. Uh, next is on the, their asset management, right? All the float that they enjoy and uh, the money. So, so th that mean came from all the investment that they're doing, let's say fiber fast, et cetera. And in the real estate was their own money. Then they realized the best way to make, um, you know, money on the real estate is OPM, right? Other people's money. For us retail investors, is the is the bank's money because banks sponsor eighty percent of it to loan, and we put on twenty percent. So what Boston Omaha also started to do is they have their own money, plus they also raise funds to uh, raise uh, you know additional money from other investors to invest in those businesses. <clears throat> One is their Dream Finders Home. Right now. This one is more around, they do an end-to-end -end of, uh, you know, building the homes and then selling it rather than buying it from um, uh, builders. Because then they can control the margin. Then they can control the overall, you know, they can reduce the cost of overall building. Uh, they also have another business called Sky Harbor which operate private, you know, airplanes and hangars. They have another business called Breezeway, which they acquired in 2016, uh, Crescent Bank, 24th Street Management, then Commercial Street. And they raised this fund called Build for Rent. This is what I was talking about is, um, instead of buying it from the builders, moved into um, basically building by themselves, and then, uh, you know, selling it out for, um, for renting it out. Because if you look at today's economy, while the stop, uh, house prices are going down, rentals are still going higher. Reason is people who wanted to buy the house can't afford it. I want a bigger house. I want to buy it. I can't afford it. Maybe I'll rent another house, bigger house, while we wait for the mortgage rates to come down. Okay. So there is a more demand for rental housing because buying a new one is becoming expensive. Number two, from a seller perspective, rather than me trying to sell a house because right now it's not a seller's market. So I would rather put it on rent and wait for uh markets to, to, to come back up. So right now, so what Boston Omaha is doing is to basically raise a fund to build uh, housing just for renting purposes. Right? So there is a private fund. Uh, other additional stuff is because you have, it's like a VC model. You raise a fund and then you can collect fee on top of you know any profit. So if you have your own money, only your own money, you do enjoy the profit. But if you also raise the money, you also get to collect the fee. And I, I don't know what the the breakup is. Is it like a, a hedge fund breakup? Uh, you know, two two plus twenty or what it is. But in any case, uh, if nothing else, um, they'll also be able to collect some fee plus on. Uh, uh, any profits that they make on selling of houses. And like I said, they work directly with the contractors um, to so that they can control the cost and not buying it from the builders and then selling it out. So these are their big businesses. Let's say recent overall, uh, <clears throat> their quarterly results. Total overall results, uh, the revenue increased 47%. As compared to last year, even though these businesses are not that high growth, but overall, it's still, uh, they saw some good growth, but it also includes one of an acquisition. Right? Net billboards grew 23%. I, I didn't expect that much. 
Broadband was 115% because this is a new business. So it's, they are, uh, and also it includes their acquisition. Uh, but still, even if the business tapers down, I think could still enjoy the, the healthy growth on the broadband side. Uh, insurance uh, grew 38%. This is great. Um, and the investment and other income at the grew only $71,000. So overall, it is, I would say from looking at their businesses, it's a steady revenue in the volatile market. Maybe if you like it, could hold something like this. The biggest thing is for now, they their uh, valuation, pretty small company from overall valuation perspective. Boston, Omaha. It's a 76, it's a $700 million. But they're on the, the trajectory is similar to what do you see with the Berkshire uh, is to own the cash flow generating businesses and also have an insurance which you know insurance supplies you with the capital you have your asset management company which is in which is from investing purposes but your other businesses are steady ready not too high growth not too volatile uh, so it could be something that you may want to put on your watch list if you're looking to park some money but uh, are you know not comfortable with the volatility in in the markets, you know, stocks going down fifty percent, sixty percent. So this maybe is something you want to put on your radar. There are a lot of companies who try to emulate the Berkshire Hathaway model. Uh, this is one of the companies. There's another one called Merkel Insurance. Um, long back we talked about it. Uh, I do hold those that stock, uh, but this one I don't have any position. So. Uh, that's a uh, Boston Omaha. Yeah. Pretty. Uh, this is the company that operate in the real world, not in the metaverse, not online, boring billboards and broadbands. But this is the businesses that brings in money. Right? Uh, broadband goes down, can't live without it. Cool. That I think this is the last topic for today. We're done. All right. Anything else? I can hang around for five minutes. Okay, it's good to be back here. I, I missed last Saturday, uh, not uh, you know talking uh, to you guys. It's fun. Noresh says too many businesses. No, I, I uh, so again. I think there model uh, except the uh, this thing uh, asset management others are the businesses that they own and let the owners run the businesses right uh, just like what Warren Buffett does he doesn't buy the business and re replace their own management but they buy the businesses which they think are uh, today they think are undervalued and have a good management because all they do so if you ask buffett he says he he's not a he's not a he can't manage a company he's a capital allocator they look at the managers of those company the ceos of the company to run those businesses themselves so from that perspective you know all these businesses are not run by ceos of boston ama those are run by the whoever were managing those businesses. Other than SP, SPY, SPX itself, best way to short is buying SPX or XPXU. Is, S, is any one of them as a leveraged? I hate leveraged funds. This is leverage too. Uh, 
so sajin i'll still repeat it like a parrot leverage funds not to be held not to be inventory you can't inventory leverage funds we have very short term duration day two days three days you want to do it then you can dabble into the leverage funds uh can't inventory it uh that would be my case on the leverage sides uh and uh, <clears throat> so yeah I, i don't deal on this one because i generally don't do that short term i have no experience on sps xs or spxu uh but uh, if you just want to do it for a particular let's say during you know the fomc announcements and we want to hold it for overnight position on what might happen to the markets yeah go ahead try it i generally look at my overall composition of portfolio and make sure i am no i you know i'm not uh, hugely uh, not carrying too many of a delta too long a deltas uh, and i manage based on that so even if it goes down 5% i'll still be okay i mean this i don't need money from my investment account to to pay my bills or to pay my expenses for next 2 years 3 years so i don't have, yeah so i don't deal on the leverage side any comment on cryptos uh, yeah we can out so the biggest upgrade on uh, the biggest news was uh, up, not upgrade but merger of uh, ethereum um main chain to the beacon chain so basically now ethereum has moved to proof of stake from a proof of work means no more miners don't there are no more miners uh, in uh, ethereum and that is where earlier there was a comment saying all those miners will be selling their gpus out in the market those nvidia gpus uh, but uh, for now crypto is is associated and work the way um the other risk assets or and you know nasdaq or high growth that's how it is right now correlated so if the markets are going down if the risk assets are uh, going down so would be crypto uh, i'm still long term hopeful on uh, on the defi stuffs on uh, you know the prospect of uh, smart contracts etc but if you heard me it this is not for my generation this will probably pan out in the next generation so but i do want to be aware of it and stay and watch it from a front seat even though it may be the next generation that might um enjoy the fruits of this but i but someone has to plant the seed and that's why i'm interested in crypto but minimum 15 year of horizon so uh one other news which i saw i don't know if you caught that or not what's happening in lebanon the lebanon residents are robbing their own bank because the government has closed the bank and the people you know the lebanon citizen assets have been uh, uh, not this one yeah the depositors can't take their money out right so there was a lot of robbing uh, the trying to you know basically unfortunately but it's their own money they can't take it out government has has larger banks and but that's what happens if you i mean this again shows the need that they, we do need a different concept of money because not in the us but there are countries around the world where these things happen so anything if with the citizens who had been saving on their banks suddenly don't have access to their own money yeah well so what else on the crypto what other news were there uh jamie diamond came and talked about 
how Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. In a way, it could be. Who knows? Uh, but at least that's one uh, asset wherein the monetary policy is fixed. No one can generate uh, it out of thin air, unlike US dollars. So, and it money is always a con. It's called right. It's a confidence game. If more and more people start to put their faith and say this is money and be confident that it will survive, then it will survive. But I'm still uh, bullish on on crypto, especially the the DeFi stuffs uh, for long term. So I'm still holding it. What happened with Jinping? China Premier. What happened? I, I, I don't know. I mean, isn't that looking for a fifth term now? Oh, this uh, I've heard is a is a uh, is a fake news. I saw it showing up in a WhatsApp of my you know friends in India, and then it like this. Someone told this is a fake news. Xi Jinping is a fake news. Chinese stocks have been under pressure. Look at a stocks like Baba. They're back to where their IPO price almost. I think Baba IPO at about seventy-five dollars years ago. Uh, let's see. Somewhere here, right? Uh, this is a weekly. Let's look at maybe 85. Oh, it's less than its IPO price. 2015. So seven years later, you can buy Alibaba at its less than at its IPO price. So Chinese stocks have been under pressure uh, also because of the the economy of China is not doing that great. I mean, the whole housing crisis, which is where most of the the retail investors in China park their money, is in the property. That is just going has gone belly, uh, you know, uh, upside down. And that might also start to show up on the U.S. side because uh, U.S., especially the commercial real estate, a lot of uh, money from Chinese investors has been in commercial estate. Uh, they've been buying a lot of properties uh, in in cities, um, or in US. And now that appetite will also go down, or maybe they'll start to selling. So that we might see some impact on the US commercial real estate because of what's happening on China. But good thing from a from a China perspective was uh, uh, Chinese regulators and uh, US regulators agreed. They re they came to an agreement that. U.S. regulators will have access to to the audits for or to the books of uh, these Chinese listed, you know, companies listed on U.S. exchanges. So that was one contention uh, that SEC had put together that if you don't provide us access, I think by 2024 those companies will have to delist from exchanges. Uh, but uh, I think some progress made in that side. B, similarly, can the brokerage firms block the customer withdrawing their money and liquidate customer account to cover firms' losses? See, today, I mean, it depends on if the government says it, they'll have to do it. But right now in the in US, uh, no, they can't because, because um, uh, the, the investors are protected by... Uh, you know the cash is is protected by SPIC, but by law, they the 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 brokerage firm's money is separate than the customer's money. So brokerage may go bankrupt, but you still will your stocks will be still your stocks because that record is kept by DTCC, and your cash is insured by SPIC. So you don't have to worry about that in US. Uh, there's a clear separation. The, the customer accounts and the customer assets are not company assets. So let's say in case of bankruptcy, the brokerage firm cannot take your assets and pay to their creditors. In crypto, it was a little different. So many people realized uh, in the crypto world. But on a brokerage, there is a clear separation. 
So the delisting fear is over. Uh, I think we still have to make some progress. I I didn't check in the last two weeks. Um, you know, did they really have access to that or not? But there were. Uh, so I think they had agreed. But did that agreement come into action or not? We have to see. But for now, I think the delisting fear is fear is over because they, in principle, they agreed to provide access to um, U.S. regulators to the to the audit books of uh, U.S. Uh, Chinese companies. But there are other fears. I mean, when you invest in China, always think. Okay, let me put it this way: think that you don't, you know. You should. You would still survive if you don't see that money coming back to you. I'll be blunt, because forget about these. Uh, you know, it's a big sovereign risk in China. What if government nationalizes the business? You don't know what could happen tomorrow. So that risk you have to be uh, aware of and be comfortable in. You know having that risk in your portfolio. So I would, I mean, so based on that, you can size your portfolio in China. Alibaba as a business may be great, but what if Chinese premier orders Alibaba saying it's, you know, you don't have to list on, you have to deal, not from a US side, but if Chinese government can pressure and saying, okay, you have to delist from there and you have to list only in Hong Kong. What can you do? So there's a lot more sovereign risk um, than the company level risk. B, so investing through crypto brokers is more risky. It looks like crypto brokerage firm can liquidate customer accounts to cover the form losses. The crypto brokerage firm can liquidate customers crypto accounts. There is, the regulation is not clear on that. In fact, I think, uh, so, so um, in fact, I think Rob, it was a Rob, not Robin Hood, Coinbase had added it in their risk. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was referring to be. The Coinbase had added it in their risk statement in uh, their previous quarterly results where they specifically mentioned that these assets could be at risk if Coinbase faces bankruptcy. And then the Twitter, crypto Twitter exploded saying Coinbase is facing bankruptcy. And then they have to come forward and say, no, no, we do want to highlight this risk, but that risk is there because the regulations or crypto do not define, I mean, we don't have that regulation. They don't define a clear separation between company assets and customer assets. So the best way is if you have more than what you can afford to lose, do self-custody. I don't know what the regulations say about safe deposit boxes. Does anyone have idea? If I have a safe deposit box and I can keep whatever I want to keep, if bank goes under, can they confiscate that? I mean, can they use that? Uh, Really, I, I I don't know. I, I never thought about it. But now, because we're talking about this thing, I just thought, what happens in that case? I know the the account, the dollars in your savings account, checking account, CDs is protected by FDIC. What happens to the safe deposits? Maybe something I'll have to search for. It. Oh, Hong Kong owners of Alibaba are real losers. I think anyone uh, who has owned Alibaba is feeling the pressure right now, including me. I also hold Alibaba. But portfolio sizing is appropriate enough. You know, is appropriate that I don't have to, uh, uh, you know, is there a pain? Yeah, but it is bearable. It's not killing me. It's not a big wound. Yeah, it's a pinch, but yeah, pinch is there. All right, looks like that's it for today. Uh, let's wrap it up right here. Thank you everyone for your time. And uh, like I said, I have to make some change to the website. Um, 
and uh, open it up. So, but should be done this week so that you all can have access to, to the document and the video, but that doesn't mean you stop coming here. My only request is uh, let's continue to engage in this session. And that could be, if you want to refresh it, then you can go back to documents on the video. All right, let's stop right here. <clears throat> we'll talk again uh, next week. Have a wonderful weekend, guys.